Thank you uh, to all of you who have come. Reminder, this is this session is the role of traditional women leaders sustain uh, my name is Laura Newman um, I'm the director of the rule of law program at the Carter as many of you may know the Carter Center is a non-governmental organization that was founded by President Jimmy Carter and his Ago, when they got out of the White House, as he liked to say, he was forcibly retired when he didn't, but wanted to continue his foundation, human rights, um, uh, other pieces of uh, parts of peace, as well as working um, on health programs. Um, I understand that I'm coming in and out. I apologize. I'm not sure why that is, but we'll just keep going. Uh, we're all used to these difficulties after nine months of COVID, so please bear with me. Uh, very to have women working with us. This session will explore the larger role that women traditional leaders play in facilitating just and peaceful societies, particularly during and following global pandemics, whether that's COVID, Ebola, or the epidemic of violence against women. As we all know, health crises disproportionately impact the lives of women socially and economically. However, women consistently emerge as organizers and information disseminators who are uniquely positioned to effectively respond to crises. Panel today, will, uh, the discussion has a goal of better understanding the role that women traditional leaders play in post-conflict societies and indigenous communities. The session will illustrate the challenges faced during health crises and the role that traditional women, particular focus on justice issues in gender-based violence and information dissemination. The session will illustrate the practical experiences, lessons and challenges faced, while also elevating the critical role that women traditional leaders play in their communities. We're joined today by, you can see two, we're gonna have three, as I said, Incredible leaders in their communities. Uh, I will introduce them uh, as soon as Ambassador Endi comes. I'll, I'll talk about her. Um, this is Dr. Fatu Taki, who's a former president of the Fifth uh, Organization. Dr. Taki is an academic and an advocate who is passionate about the empowerment of women and girls. Uh, Dr. Taki holds a PhD in multidisciplinary social sciences and an MA studies from the Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, United Kingdom, and up in education and a BA degree in English French, college at the University of Sierra Leone. Director of Academic and Career Advisory and Counseling Services. She um, has been the head of the Students' Complaints Commissioner at the University of Sierra Leone for its three uh, constituent colleges. She's also a lecturer in the Department of Language Studies and the Institute for Gender Relation. Welcome. We also have um, Lucy Simpson, the Executive Director for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Uh, Ms. Simpson brings a wealth of legal and public policy experience, uh, having served as an attorney in Indian country for almost 20 years. Prior to joining the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, she served as the public policy coordinator for the Sacred Circle and the senior staff attorney Indian Law Resource Center, where she worked in the Center Safe Women, Native American women in this country. Uh, Ms. Simpson received her bachelor's degree from Stanford University and her law degree from Colorado at Boulder. Um, perfect timing. We have Ambassador Julie Endy, who is the Executive Director for Liberia Crusaders for Peace. Uh, and, and, um, ambassador Endy is the Cultural Ambassador of the Republic of Liberia. She is the Executive Director of the Liberia Crusaders for Peace, a national NGO involved in advocacy, peace building, social mobilization. Management. Social and peace advocate promoting peace, reconciliation, health, culture, and children's rights.
for over two decades and has contributed to several peace initiatives in Liberia, including the 2003 Accra Peace Accord that ended the Liberian Civil War. She also has been involved in the declaration of the Mano River Union Traditional Women uh, and the recently held Liberia Peace Conference in dialogue with traditional leaders. We're very pleased to have uh, Ambassador Endy with us. Um, there's an election tomorrow in Liberia and as a, as a peace ambassador, she plays a large role. Um, so thank you so much to all of you. I know she's under the name Dorbor Jala. Um, that is a colleague of ours, she's using his screen, but uh, Ambassador Endy, I'd like to start with you if I may. Um, and if you could tell us a bit about the situation facing women in Liberia. Um, as well as the role that traditional women have played, particularly during these health epidemics, whether it's Ebola or COVID or uh, the increase in violence against women, what is the role for traditional leaders? Um, and if you could talk a little bit about uh, the challenges and also the successes. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. If you can hear me, I'm very happy to be here uh, at the Carter Center and to participate uh, on this panel to be able to give my experience uh, working with traditional women and just women of Liberia. And if you can hear me and it's, and it's clear, I would like to, to just say that Liberian women, first I can say to them and I give them the pat on the back and say they're very strong. Uh, some of the things that we, we do here as women and accept it's not an easy thing. It's very challenging. Uh, what we are faced with right now is sexual gender-based violence, uh, domestic violence, uh, violence against women. We are also faced with rape, uh, marginalization, and of course, the political divide of our country. Uh, but what we have been able to do is to change our crisis into opportunities. And and use whatever God has given us to be able to stand up and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. So in all in all, you have women advocates that are standing up for, for, for justice, women are standing up against FGM, uh, women in the communities and the villages for the youth, women in marketplaces, the women are making sure there's food to be in the market, you know, for, for people to buy. At the same time, the women are also peacemakers within the political setting of our country. And of course, things have changed. Some of the challenges women were faced with is additional uh, 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 way of dispensing justice. And so the women are sitting now at a table and making decisions along with the men. It was very difficult in the past to have women chiefs. Now we have women chiefs, we have women sitting with the traditional leaders, and women roles and responsibility in health crisis like Ebola and, 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 and COVID is, is, is very glaring and straightforward. The women are in a hospital as nurses, the women are caregivers, they are in the community, they are the first respondent because the children come to them, the husband comes to them, the brothers come to them. So women play a very major role in our peace process and in, 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 in advocacy for justice and leadership in Liberia. But we are also faced with challenges that women are molested, abused, raped, and you know, maybe domestic violence, gender of their spouses. And it's because even those days in our, in our setting, when the women pick up the radio, the men will tell them which channel to listen to because they don't want you for your eyes to be open. But all with consistency in advocacy, knowing the women rights, women, women inherited, the inheritance bill on portion of your husband's property it is yours, how you take care of yourself, how you make your own decision. Women have their own telephone, they can dial numbers, they can go to the market, and all of that, but uh, but we are still faced with the, the, the challenges of marginalization when it comes to political arrangements and all of that. We don't have any woman political party. We always women win, you know, women win in a party. 
So these are some of the things that I want to say, but women play a major role in disseminating information when it comes to health and peace. Like in the COVID-19, more women were hired in the communities, in the villages, in towns to carry the messages on, you know, the preventive measures. And the women are the ones that put the water in the bucket with the soap, to put it outside for the people to wash their hands and have soap and clean water. And it's most of the mobilizers and communicators that you see. And if you go into the, the town hall meetings, you see more women coming out to listen to the messages and those women are also messengers to carry the messages in the community. But at the same time, they see their children being raped. And, and now the role that they're playing now is to just say, okay, let's get rid of FGM, is to change what is FGM to more productive and a cultural setting in educating our people about their own health and their own lives. You showed everybody hearing me? We are hearing you loud and clear, Ambassador. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I was, I was just talking, I said, so let me just stop there and then we can continue from there because I didn't know whether you were really listening to me. We hear you. Yes, and there's a lot of organizations headed by women. So we have the Women NGO Secretariat. Those NGOs that are headed by women, they are on a bigger umbrella for Wanguso. And what is happening in Women NGO is actually a network of women issues. How do we talk about sexual exploitation and abuse? How do we help adolescent girls? How do we help adolescent girls discuss different issues about women? How do we network to support women political part and uh, uh, political aspirants to be able to, 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 to get into the race with men? How do we do social media monitoring to know whether they are bullying the women over social media? And these are some of the things in network we are doing and also um, having a situation room for women, women in a political parties, women in organizations and leadership, how they are treated and all of that. So Liberian women, we are doing what we think we are doing. We, we would love to do more, but sometimes economic sustainability is a problem with Liberian women. That's why most of the time when Liberian women get involved, whether it's small or medium businesses, is 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 difficult to sustain because we lack the, the sustainability plan, the economic economic sustainability plan, or because you got to depend on your husband to give you the money, and if they don't give you the money, you can't continue what you want to do. It's sometimes you know it's, it's it's difficult to say, but sometimes men get very envious of potential women, and so it's another another issue that women are faced with and 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 because you don't have the resources when you when you try leadership with the men they always overpower you so then in the traditional setting the traditional leaders now when they get up the carter center they now know the rights of women because carter center have worked with the women for a very long time especially traditional women in peace building whether at the national level or at the regional level or at international level or with ECOWAS or the Mano River Basin to use culture as a medium to communicate peace messages throughout the basin, which is La Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia to be able to come together and, and, and cement our relationship so that we know what's happening in each other countries and what's happening around the borders and just using the Coca Tunnel platform by the Carter Center to continue to engage each other in these different parts of Africa. Thank you, Ambassador. That was fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing play 
uh, traditional women play in Liberia. I think, you know, anything, as you said, we can change crisis into opportunity. And as women, as you said, are the nurses, the caregivers, the first responders, but they're also the mobilizers. They're also the ones that are sharing all that information. And again, as, as you point out, women can do even more if we can help overcome some challenges that you've identified speaking out throughout the next hour or hour and 15 minutes together. So I see that I'm breaking in and out. I hope that uh, what I'm saying is coming out clearly. I apologize to everyone. It's amazing. Everyone else's uh, internet seems to be better than ours here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but we'll continue. Uh, again, thank you, Ambassador. Please stay with us because I know people are going to have lots of questions for you um, about the role, especially maybe later on about the role that women played to really change the course of Ebola uh, in Liberia and what we can learn from that. So uh, I'd like to turn to um, Lucy Simpson. If you could, Lucy, share with us a bit of the work that you and your organization are doing with Native American women in the United States to address this health epidemic of um, violence against women. Thank you so much. Hi, um, good morning. It's, um, or I guess it's good afternoon here now. Um, my name is Lucy Simpson and I am the executive director of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. I'm coming to you from Lame Deer, Montana, which is the um, capital of the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation. Um, our organization is a Native-led, uh, uh, women-led nonprofit organization dedicated to ending violence against Native women and children. And our primary goals are to do this by supporting tribal sovereignty and um, advocating for um, tribal programs and tribal women advocates, um, most of whom are, um, are survivors themselves of violence and help to build their capacity to, um, to serve native victims, survivors of violence in their own communities. Uh, so I have a little PowerPoint presentation that I'm gonna go through a little bit of here. Um, so what we do is we provide uh, national leadership in working to end gender-based violence in tribal communities. Uh, we do this by offering culturally grounded resources and um, training and also policy development to strengthen tribal sovereignty. Our work is focused on domestic violence, sexual violence, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, stalking and sex trafficking. And a lot of um, you know what I mentioned, we, we do this by offering culturally grounded resources. For us, it's really important to do things from a cultural perspective. There are 563 different federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, all of them have their own tribal government um, formats, um, different uh, leadership. Some are more um, advanced in, in the sense of having, you know, a, a council and a president's office and all of that. And some of them do um, are more traditional in their approaches and they're all different. Um, they have their own languages, they have their own cultural traditions, creation stories, histories, and so we can't provide, there's no one um, way to do this. Um, so a lot of what we do is really providing support to tribal programs to be able to develop their own programs that fit their own communities, because we can't just go in and tell people how to do things. They need to be able to develop what um, based on their culture, their community, their needs, and their relationships is what's so important. Um, so violence against Native women um, is not a traditional thing. Um, it didn't really um, begin to uh, develop in tribal communities until colonization. And women are the backbone of our communities. Um, and so it was a formal tactic of colonization to attack the women. If you attack the women, then you attack the strength of the communities. And uh, a, a saying from the Northern Cheyenne tribe, which is where our main office is, is a nation is not defeated until the heart of its women are on the ground. And so it just sort of, um, you know, it is a good explanation of the power of women um, and the strength of women and that our philosophy is to really be able to rebuild our communities and strengthen our communities. We have to have our women safe um, because our women really um, do, do so much of that. They're the foundation. 
Um, and so, you know, since colonization, we've seen more and more violence against Native women. Um, more than four in five Native women have experienced some sort of violence in their lifetime. More than half of Native women have faced um, physical intimate partner violence. More than half of Native women have experienced sexual violence. One in three Native women have been raped in their lifetime. Over 90% of the individuals who commit these crimes are non-Native. Um, that's individuals from other races, not Native, um, native um, perpetrators. Um, and more than 6,000 Indigenous women have been reported missing across the United States as of 2016. So it's really a, a crisis um, that's been happening for hundreds of years since colonization. Um, so in crisis, addressing gender-based violence during COVID-19 um, has been difficult. Uh, we see an escalated risk of violence due to the self isolation and the stay at home orders. We often hear about, you know, you're, um, you're not home alone, you're safe at home, but in a lot of situations, being at home is not safe. That's where you know, domestic violence is happening. Um, and it's something that is already a uh, taboo of not being spoken about. People, you know, people don't talk about it openly. There's so much shame involved in that, that people are suffering um, in their homes um, more so now with a lot of the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders that we're seeing across the country and in tribal communities. Um, and we've also seen the, you know, the impact on our tribal economies. A lot of our tribes have been forced to furlough many of their um, victim services program staff. So, um, in the tribal advocacy programs that provide assistance to victims of violence, their staff is deemed non-essential and so they're no longer working. So we have women who do come forward needing help are not able to get that help. Um, most tribal providers, particularly in rural America, where a lot of our Indian reservations are located, um, are not equipped to offer um, remote support due to limited internet and cell phone service infrastructure. For myself, um, you know, just personally, my home does not have um, a phone line or internet. We have to do a satellite. Um, and so it's not very, um, um, you know, consistent. Um, uh, there's not broadband availability throughout um, Indian country. We think about the United States being one of the most developed countries in the world, um, our native, um, our Indian reservations often do not have the same um, technological availability that are, that are, that's there in other places. We just got cell phone service on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, so that's just an example. Um, with the uh, public health restrictions that are increasing um, and the stress that it's causing, we're seeing an overwhelming burden on our tribal um, victim services and our law enforcement our medical facilities and our tribal courts, which are already extremely under-resourced even before COVID-19. So it makes it very difficult. Um, so one of the things that our organization has done um, in joining our um, sister organizations is we've been um, advocating at a national policy level for critically needed federal resources to Indian tribes uh, that serve native victim survivors. Um, and, and just an example, you know, one of the philosophies that we have as an organization is really building, helping to build the movement and bringing other um, Native voices to the table and Native women voices to the table and advocating for uh, that not necessarily just to be leaders in the sense of, you know, people that are leading organizations by myself, but bringing up the voices of Native survivors themselves to be able to explain what they've been going through and what their needs are. And that's the most important um, part of this work is making sure that people understand um, from, from those who are the most impacted and not, um, not speaking for them, letting them speak for themselves because their voices are important. Um, so, you know, I'd mentioned before the um, impact of colonization and this ongoing effort to, um, to terminate indigenous people and the, and the strategic attack of native women. Um, but it's through our resilience that we're, we've survived and we're still here. Um, I think that um, 
uh, the ambassador was talking earlier about the strength of of the traditional women in Liberia, and 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 we see that here in the United States, that strength and resilience of our Native women to um, to continue to to do the work and and be that backbone and be that foundation of our communities, and um, and it's just so so important to to bring those voices um, and lift them up and give them the opportunity to to be a part of. Um, the the advocating and the efforts to to improve our native communities um i think that is oh oh so there's one more slide here um and and this is just another slide that sort of is is some of what i've been talking about already um i think that is all for my presentation and i will um turn it back over to you, Laura, and um, that might give us a little more time at the end for questions. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Lucy. That was, that was fascinating, fascinating, especially hearing especially about here, the colonization about and its role in impacting women, um, Native women, something that I certainly wasn't aware of. But I think this issue that you raise about no one size fits all, the need to really be culturally um, to take a cultural perspective. I know that's true in Liberia and it's, it's also true where you are. And, and this also this idea of bringing out the voices that the traditional women having their voices at the forefront is so critical. So it was time to move to Dr. Taki, but I don't see her on. I think she may have fallen away just as we need her most. So um, in light of that small challenge, Perhaps what I can do is, while we're waiting for her, could I ask you, um, Ambassador Endy, while we're waiting for Dr. Taki, would you mind talking a little bit about some of the specific professional women played to turn around Ebola when it was in your communities? That um, I think I think people would love to hear the story of how Ebola was not being handled uh, until traditional women got involved. Um, and, and after that, we'll hopefully have Dr. Taki back and she can talk about her, her experiences in Sierra Leone. Uh, but perhaps, Ambassador, would you be willing to talk a bit about the specifics of the role that traditional women play during the Ebola crisis? Well, uh, during the Ebola crisis, uh, the Ministry of Health was concentrating on epidemiologists. They were looking for experts, but what they didn't know was the, the, the community was very important and that if people would get out gathered in a community and take the and take responsibility, we were going to succeed. So the first meeting was held at the Ministry of Health, and they started the process, but the traditional leaders were not involved. So someone quickly let them know because I had a meeting with them and I said, but what's the way are they were the traditional people in this in this? But when the traditional leaders came on board, they organized a meeting with the Carter Center in Bangabong County, which is central Liberia. It was at that meeting that the traditional, I still have the video. I'm gonna share that video and pictures with you in the future. I will give it to uh, Dr. Jala to give it to you. And you will look at it. So when we went to this meeting in Bangabong County and the women gathered and said, look, we will take responsibility and be the front runner of this. We will go from village to village. We will go from town to town. We will speak to our people. We will live by example. So they started following the preventive measure by washing their hands. And don't forget that everything that was a no-no within Ebola uh, prevention was against the traditional people. The traditional people are the ones that eat together in the same pan. The traditional people welcome is with a hug. The traditional people like to shake hands. So all of these things were no, no, and, and the traditional people love to eat uh, uh, dry meat. So all these things were against the traditional belief of our people, but they had to come together, come with a decision and say, we are going to take the lead. And so they took the lead and they agreed that they would not you, you know, because we, we are not used to burning the bodies. We are using, we are used to going to a funeral home and burying people. But we have to change that. Instead of using, you know, burning the bodies, the traditional leaders got together. They found a land 
where they gave to the government of Liberia to be able to bury our dead instead of burning them because it's not part of our culture. Then the traditional women asked the Carter Center for Mika phones, Mika phones, and it went out into the community from door to door, from marketplace to marketplace, market day, from churches, from the mosques, and everybody got together and were able to get to where we are today. The day Liberia was declared Ebola free, the women came together and they had an honoring program. But in all of the good things and the strength of Liberian women, there are still challenges. And when she was speaking from the United States of America, I gather a lot of information that I didn't know. And I would like to gather more, you know, maybe through a network for us to, 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 because for us, I feel today that we are interrelated because some of the things that is happening with them is the same that is happening with us. The way the, the traditional women within the urban areas are treated is totally different from the way the traditional women in the rural areas. Now, people think that uh, they have people that are educated in terms of formal education, and you are from a traditional background. You are an indigenous person. So to, to, to work with our people, because there's so many things that are going on with our women. Violence against women is at it is now a no-go zone. I'm, I'm telling you, we are happy with the he for she, but more needs to be done. Because during the COVID-19, because there was lockdown, state of emergency, it was the same time domestic violence went on the rise because the women were at home they, before the husband would go to work, but these people became non-essential staff. They came back home and their wives at home. They took the whole burden and put it on the, on, 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 the, on the wife. And so there were too many domestic violence going on. If you listen to the, the, the if you look at the data from the call center, at the same time, they were reporting COVID-19 cases. They were reporting domestic violence cases. I mean, and people, now we talk all these things about sexual gender-based violence. We do all the data, we collect the data, we go to the, the, the station, the state center, we bring them, to, we want the perpetrators to bring to justice. As soon as the person is arrested, we stop. So what happens after that is what we really need to start documenting. Well, the women of Liberia play a major role during the Ebola crisis. I mean, I know of a, a governor who is a female. She will go to Cape Mount, educate the people in Cape Mount, come to Clarata, educate the people in Clarata. And there were, there were messages she was giving in the vernacular. There were more, more, more explicit than the messages that were being given by race community, people from race communications. So our, our, and then our women, if you go back to the record of Liberia, the women play a major role during the peace, our, the war in Liberia in, in, in peace building. Then that's why you have all these different, different women organizations, Akuka Tona Peace Women, WIPNET, Maonet, Crusaders for Peace, all these different women organizations. We had to stand up as women of Liberia to say, this madness must stop and it should stop now. And we put the men in the house in Ghana, in Accra, Ghana, and we lock the door on them. I said, until you people agree, we will not open the door on you all. And guess what? They agree, they open the door, they agree to cease fire. That's how we came out with the Accra Peace and Call. So women have been playing a significant role in not only in crisis like health, in polio, polio eradication. The women of Liberia were very instrumental to make sure that Liberia was declared polio free. Yellow fever. The story that I learned is that it was the women of Liberia that cleaned the city of Monrovia. I was not born at the time. Clean the city of Monrovia that made us to get the yellow fever vaccine because of cleanliness. I'm saying that to say women have been playing major role in the past and continue to play. Have we done enough? No. More needs to be done. We asked for 30% in the national legislature. They got one woman in the Senate. In the, in the Senate of 30 
30 persons, only one woman, less than seven women in the in, in, the, in the house. So we, we are fighting all the time. And I see what is going on now. If you look at if you look at the data that we are collecting, you don't even have many women in the race. So women have been marginalized. What we are saying with the kind of story that we heard from the United States, we need more networking, we need more conversation, we, because the story just like ours. Great, thank you, thank you so much. I, I see that Dr. Taki is trying to come back and, and struggling a little bit. Um, so I'd like to actually, until she comes back, and maybe when she comes back, we'll we'll pause and let her her jump in with uh, the situation in in Sierra Leone. But I'd like to ask both um, you, Lucy, and you, Ambassador Endy, how does your organization engage the critical voices of traditional women? So I know in lead organizations that are the that are um, on the front line. How are you engaging those critical voices of your traditional women leaders in the work that you're doing? But before you answer that, uh, Dr. Taki, are you able to hear us? Yay, okay, Dr. Taki, before we lose you again, uh, you all, the rest of you, hold on to that question. Dr. Taki, could you tell us a little bit about the situation for women, um, for the traditional women in Sierra Leone and how they've played such a critical role in assuring peace and justice during these health crises? Dr. Taki, can you can you hear us? We can see you. I'm not sure you can hear us. I seem to be having some okay. internet problems, so I'm not sure. Perfect. We can hear you now. Could Thank you tell you. us a bit about Sierra Leone? Yep, we can hear you. You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, afternoon. Um, so I am um, Fatutaki and uh, past president, immediate past of the 5050 group. Um, now, as, as the name implies, the 5050 um, group is, is a gender advocacy, it's a gender parity um, advocacy group. And um, we work with a lot of um, women organization and um, um, actually and some male led organizations that have we, we have who we call the male champions or the he for she's and then um, we look at various things um, including um, having more women in mainstream um, and leadership mainstream politics and in leadership. And um, with this, most of what we do is advocacy and training. So we work with a lot of policymakers at the end of the day. And um, we, we do a lot of trainings um, within communities um, for people to get the, the skills that they need um, to be able to find themselves on a platform where they can be leaders and where they can be where decisions are made, especially on behalf of women. Um, now, through 50-50, as I'm sure a lot of so been um, an 11 year civil war, and um, this went up to about 2000 and 2002 um, when it was declared over. But what is what is key is the significant. The, the role that women have played that you, you, you simply cannot be ignored. Um, so when we had a civil, of course, it was very blatant at the time that it was non-inclusive. So that um, when peace talks were being held, women were not there, and the, the war went on. And of course, uh, a lot of women and children lost their lives. Men lost their lives as well, and their livelihoods as well. Um, but when women got to the point to say enough is enough, 
and they would want to have peace in a country, um, women were taken seriously. So this was women from various communities. This was women from all um, walks of life came together and said, okay, we'll have a demonstration. I'm sure that we show time that we would want peace in the country. And in fact, there was, um, you know, there was a consideration whether we should have the peace before we have democratic elections or not. And the women were in the forefront to say, no, actually, we would like to have a democratic elections. And the women were thus um, um, included to be part of the peace talks. And um, this is where it's, it's brought us. So when we had conferences, so one, one very, I, I'm not sure if this happens in, 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 in other places, but Sierra uh, Leone is one key place where there's always the accusation of women don't support each other, women don't work together. And um, various times over and over, um, women might have their differences, but you see that once there's community work and there's collaboration, there's always positive results. And in fact, some of these things, having it the Bintumani 1 and 2, which were the conferences for peace, and the conferences to have democratic processes in Sierra Leone, um, we've had the coalitions where, and, and in fact, the VCC, during the Ebola time, we started a wrestle, which at the time was the women's response to Ebola in Sierra Leone. So even when the government was taking steps and not being inclusive and not um, hearing the voices of what women who were obviously care, care, um, the caregivers, who were the nurses, who looked after the loved ones, um, so women put themselves together and say, fine, we would need to take the messages out. We would need to, to take the messages to the community, to our people, to our families, to our neighborhoods, so that they understand how to prevent um, themselves getting um, Ebola, contracting Ebola. And so with some support, we, we and even, um, you know, women uh, decided to, to put in their own monies. So we had contributions from ourselves, and then um, bought the Nika buckets that went around, bought drums of water, got water supplies, got um, the sanitizer, got the bleach, and took into market places, and took into different places, um, and take the sensitization for people to understand that if your loved one is ill, you take that person to the hospital. You don't touch. So these are um, the things cementing also and the women's movement in Sierra Leone. So whether it has to do with peace and sustainability, whether it has to do with financial development, whether it has to do with the health crisis. So now, um, in fact, as after the Ebola, no one expected anything like COVID. Um, so by the time, but then we had what the, the mod slide, we had flooding. So we put ourselves together and gave support to, to um, various communities, women and children. In fact, then when you find out that um, in these cases, the men would, would accept then that actually we need the women um, to be in front of we do, we do there um, to make some of the decisions, especially where the children um, were concerned, but also especially where they were concerned because they for them um, when they were ill. So sort of turn of respect started um, itself. Um, with women, even in the in the villages, even in uh, various communities in the rural as well as um, the urban areas. So when COVID came, which obviously was unexpected, also then we 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 changed the wrestle to women's response to emergencies, because we find out that okay, we we don't seem to be um, getting short of emergencies now, whether it, whether it's um, natural disasters. So therefore, putting ourselves to where we work to give support. So with the COVID, we work to give um, um, female doctors support. We work to give the nurses support. We, we, we go around and do sensitization nationwide. So we worked with them um, in the most remote areas, um, especially if they had um, a mobile phone connections, what giving support um, with data so that if the women house, they, they, we, we got cheap Android phones. Um, so this was with some support from some of our partners. We got some cheap Android phones. And what we did was set up WhatsApp groups 
and um, and and gave data to to these women. So real time information we were having. If something was happening in any community, we were able to know where we were, and um, and try to see how we can give them with whatever is happening. Um, so putting ourselves is a key thing that we found is a uh, very um, over the years that um, there's a strong element of resilience there, commitment. And the more we do advocacy, the more people are aware, there's a lot of enlightenment. And the more they are aware, they start to make informed choices and even challenge some of the norms. Because we, we live in a very patriarchal um, society. And um, there's still places and, and uh, women are not supposed to talk when men, uh, women are not supposed to lead or women are not supposed to make decisions. So, but because advocacy over the years that we've been doing, um, there's a lot of understanding and enlightenment. So therefore, what we find now, I think is, is a lot will find themselves in a state of confusion because they're not understanding what is happening that um, what um, women will be normally quiet and silent about, um, they're raising their voices now. Um, they're, they're making sure they're, hard. they're asking questions. So whether it has to be do with um, trends, whether it's violence, whether it has to do with rape, whether it has to do, um, these are questions that are being asked. Well, why is this happening? And what is so there's there's a there's a slight talk now mystic because um now um I see we, the, there's a lot of foundation has been laid. I also see um some change happening. In the policies, there's always obviously the the, the the implementation where we have laws for the implementation, but because the a lot of women are understanding what these laws are now and what it means to them. Um, they question a lot of these things. I'm saying that with the advocacy we've been doing and all, you know, working with the commitment and the resilience, there's something coming from there's there's this of um, will coming from the government um, um, and even the past government in terms of the laws that we've had. And in terms of facilities, that are, we have one sort of sexual and gender where we have the family support unit within the police to so go and make complaints. We have a special court now just for victims of sex, for, for all offenses that have to do with gender based violence. And we have specialized judges who have been trained. To look at so um, in the next uh, um, few years we would see um, I hope that um, things will get better but at, at the same time people will be more enlightened we're having a lot more girls and women go to school so even the last uh, terms we had which is um, which we call the in primary school exam um, which is normally for the olds um, we've had 66-year-old women who's because they see that they need to empower themselves and learn so that they, they become more useful um, within their communities. The traditional leaders, the traditional women have been playing this role. They, they've had a traditional role, um, but it's women lead, so not really making decisions where men are concerned. Um, but of this now, and uh, um, there are places where women would not necessarily be able to speak or say anything, but now their voices are gradually from all over the and they're all over the country. There is a lot of um, um, questions that are that are, that need to be answered from the politicians, from the governors, from people who are leaders in our communities, from our religious. Because a lot of these things would normally be swept under the carpet. So it happens then COVID, um, someone is being um, 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 defiled, 
someone is being um, harassed, we don't speak about this. We speak, speak them under the carpet because it would be your voice against, you know, some powerful individual's voice, who is normally a man. But now there's a lot of this happening. And using social media is, uh, like I say, they, it's, I think they find themselves in a state of confusion because things that we normally not talk about, use it to, to talk about these things, to, to talk about these things and, and bring out to the open, um, which makes um, everyone of us and why we've encouraged these things to happen up to this point. We, with, with, and I think with the government's commitment now to shun us, especially in the stands, um, once the enlightenment and the education comes to gain, which in turn should be able to change some of the social and cultural what we have time, that these should not be norms, but these are things that need to change. So this is where we find ourselves in. I don't know if you've, you've heard me, and I can I can go on and on if you want me to. Um, but um, Laura, just let me know if... Uh, Thank you. If no, I we heard, heard everything, Dr. Taki. That was wonderful. And, um, you know, I think all of you um, have raised something that's so interesting. It's, it's a bit perverse, but it seems that in the moments of crises, that's when women's voices, particularly traditional women's voices, are actually their loudest and their most impactful. And so I think um, through our discussion, hopefully we'll be able to think a bit of how do we retain that even in moments where there aren't crises. Uh, but I'd like to go back to all three of you and ask a bit about your organizations and how your organizations work to elevate the critical voices of traditional women or traditional chiefs uh, or religious leaders. I know um, for all three of you, you've talked about the importance of having that space for hearing directly from the women most impacted and those leaders. So if you could talk a little bit about the how you do that? How does your organization elevate those voices uh, and make them meaningful? And and perhaps we can start. Um, why don't we start uh, the way that that we began, uh, Ambassador? If you could start. Um, uh, although I think we're losing you. So, oh no, you're still there. How do how do you how does uh, Crusaders for Peace elevate the traditional women's the chiefs' voices? Well. Um from our setting, we as Crusaders for Peace, uh, fortunately, let me put it that way for Crusaders for Peace, I'm the traditional queen of Liberia and the cultural ambassador of Liberia. I make me the voice of the traditional people. I'm also a liaison between the traditional leaders and national government in terms of development. And I'm an artist. So with that, with my writing skills and knowing the various languages of Liberia, the vernacular, I communicate very easily with the traditional leaders and the Crusaders for Peace have their plus. The, there are a lot of great women in Liberia, but the story about those great women are untold stories. So for that reason, we are using different levels of platform to get the traditional women to come up, to speak so their voices cannot be silent. And I think that's what I said from my opening statement that we work along with the Carter Center because during those days, about a couple of years ago, you, we, ne we, we never had traditional female chiefs. It was all males, males, males. And so when the males are making decisions, they go out into the upper room and the women will sit outside. The men will make the decision and then come back and say, so say one, so say all. Mm. So the, the women never had a role to play in a traditional meeting, even the Kola not. The women were only there to bring the calabash with a color law to give it to the chief so that the chief sent it over to whatever they want to do with it. So these women, they were not decision maker. As we speak today, women are decision maker. 
The second most powerful person in the council is a female. Mm. And it has never happened in our history, in our culture. Now it is happening. Another thing that we are doing, we are taking the women to various workshops, conferences, seminars, where they are traveling to different parts of the world. They are going to the visiting Sierra Leone. We have this unique thing about the Kuka Tunnel women of the Mano River Basin. They travel to the US, they, they go to the CSW, and they allow the traditional women to do their own presentation. Unlike before, they will only give it to women with formal education. Now the traditional women are on par with the women, with the educated ones. Now, another thing, another platform for the women is the, the community action platform where women express themselves. The only time you are wrong if you don't say it. So you say anything that you want to say and they correct you along the way. We are also raising their voices with adult education. Mm -hmm. Where some of the women are now being, you know, they are old, but there's nothing for education. You can never be old for education. And the women first, we started with them of learning how to put your telephone number, how somebody can give you number and you memorize the number to put it down. How you go back to a telephone to say, oh, I want to call this person and this is the person. Even if you have to stole the person name with an A and a B or a C or a D. Now, these mm -hmm. traditional women are saying, okay, if the UN and the government of Liberia want to suspend the poro and Sunday society, is their problem. But if you want us to stop FGN, they give us something to do. So what they are doing now is that the areas and the timing of the Sunday and poorer, they are using it for development purposes. They are making farm, they are into agriculture. They got some of the most beautiful agriculture farms now. They want to be independent, at the same time, sustainable. So they, they so instead of begging, you know, right now they, they are making, we are building, they are building roads. So those roads to marketplaces, to empower our women, our women are now standing up and say, hey, with the inheritance bill, thanks to the cattle center. And they are saying, oh, hey, if I marry you today, I am entitled to your property. And the, the percentage of your property that I'm entitled to, before our women, they will never go to court to say, look, I'm, I was married to this man, and this is the property we acquired, and this is mine. Now they can do that. Now they can, if you, if you, if, if some of them, they are going to the female lawyers. The Female Lawyers Association of Liberia is really working with these women in terms of knowing their legal mind, legal rights. It never used to happen. Our women, before it used to be just traditional leaders as, uh, uh, I don't know how you would call it, justice of the peace, judges, or investigators in terms of cases in that community. No, they have women leaders now that can sit on a case and plead the case in with honesty and fairness and the, and the youth are saying, hey, we want more women to be in the community for dispute. So these are some of the, uh, what Priscilla mm -hmm. is doing is working with different women groups depending on programs and all of that. So that those critical voices, not only women, but young girls, Adolescent girls, if you have to speak out when you are when you are harassed, when there's sexual harassment, when, when the value, you know, to come up and know your rights, your know, health status. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Lucy, you talked about the importance of survivors' voices. How are you also engaging um, traditional women in your communities? I, I hear when you say there's 500 different tribes, so I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to ask you that as such a general question. But you know, how are, are those voices coming forward? And, and Ambassador Endy made a really good point that it's unusual. It wasn't, it wasn't usual to give that space to women. Um, but now they're taking it in Liberia, and we're going to hear about Sierra Leone as well. What is the situation for women traditional leaders in your communities, and how are you working to elevate those voices, especially against domestic violence or violence against women? Right. Well, like I had mentioned before, one of the things that we try and do is to help lift up the voices of survivors and survivors as experts themselves. Um, 
you know, so that that's a I think a big piece of of what we try and do. Um, and um, you know, even when we're just providing technical assistance to tribal programs throughout the country in terms of developing their organization, how they're going to start, board of directors, staffing, really uh, making the point that you know you don't need you know, the, the survivors are the experts themselves. They know what they need. They know what their communities need. Um, and so having that kind of leadership that you don't have to necessarily be, you know, that formally educated, you know, a lot of survivors are, but I'm saying that the, the point being that it's the, the personal experience and the knowledge that people have um, who have gone through this themselves, that's the the most expert you can be in terms of how to actually make change within your community. So that that's a big a big part of what we do. Um, and and we do that by, as ambassador mentioned, you know, bringing um lifting people up, bringing them to conferences. Um, we do a lot of work, not just advocating within the United States within, um, the federal government here, but also on an international basis. And so when we do participate in um, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples or um, the CSW or different things like that, we participate and we also bring um, uh, people from, you know, tribal women from their communities to speak as well. Um, you know, it's not just our voice, it's the voice of tribal leadership themselves. Um, and that can be women who might be elected to tribal councils it, and, or just um, women leaders within the community and recognizing that those voices are as important, if not more important than your elected leadership on issues when it comes to what is actually impacting on the ground in our communities. So we make an effort to do that on a regular basis. Um, you know, here on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, they just had their tribal elections last uh, last month in November, and all women made it to, um, um, to all the open spots here were all women. We have a, 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 a Cheyenne woman as president. We have a Cheyenne woman as um, vice president. We have, um, there were five open tribal council seats, all women elected. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's also just um, doing what we can, not, you know, not advocating in elections, but just to in general, raise the voices of women um, and that that importance that you know women really do form the foundation of our communities, and we have to um, uh, listen to their voices, li listen to their ideas, and um, and and that's that's really important. Uh, another thing that I think we do that's sort of part of our philosophy is this idea that you know um, women are, women are sacred. Um, traditionally, women are sacred. Even today, women are sacred in our communities. And um, to to be able to, um, you know, a lot of our tribal communities are matriarchal, matrilineal. Um, but when it came to colonization, their role as leaders within their community was diminished. And so it's a matter of of sort of re reigniting that um, within our communities. So we do a lot of um, training opportunities on um, on the role of women, the role of women traditionally, the role of women today. Um, we do a lot of uh, webinars and that sort of thing. And we did a series before on our creation stories. Different tribes did their creation stories and what the role of women are in that. And a lot of what we do, especially when we're looking at um, working with youth, is um, you know helping tribes and and local programs think about how to incorporate their own traditions and um, their own teachings about how we respect women. Um, what the role of men are, what the role of two-spirit LGBTQ are within our community and coming back to a place where we are respecting all of these different roles and they all have a place and they all have to work together. Um, and when we do that, then we can actually make real social change um, to, to help combat these um, hundreds of years of colonization where violence has become a uh, almost a norm in, in some places. And so that's a, a big part of what we do also is just really focusing on that cultural component um, and 
um, and that cultural component for our tribal communities really are our traditional teachings, um, which on its own just recognizes the role of women, the role of elders, the role of ceremony women, um, and the importance that they have in balancing. You can't have a ceremony um, with without women as a part of it and sort of reminding people that that they're, you know, it, it might not necessarily be that role out in front, um, but what women do, you you can't you can't move forward without their their participation. Um, and so it's just sort of reminding at all different levels. So even at our um, you know, when it comes to uh, tribal governments, even when you have tribal governments where the leadership might be men, it's making sure that they're, you know, one of the things that we do is there's this process of consultation that happens between um, tribal governments and the federal government, and it's a required process. And so during that consultation, only tribal government leaders are allowed to speak. Um, and so where you have um, a lot of tribal tribal governments that only have elected men, um, you know, helping to make sure that they're including the voices of women. Um, and sometimes that is um, working with them to, um, they can assign, you know, give their speaking role to an advocate within their tribal program. And so working with those advocates who are often survivors, who are generally women and making sure that their voices are brought to the table. So it's a lot of the behind the scenes kind of work that I think we do, but um, it in that way that raises the the voices of the women actually doing, doing the on the ground work. Um, and um, Another part of what we do, I think, um, and it's more of it's it's more of our philosophy. But I mentioned earlier about part of what we do is trying to build the movement. And so we're a national organization. We're um, we we have a a place, a chair um, at a lot of different tables at the national level. Um, but there are very few Native women organizations that are at that table, and so. One of the things that we've been doing is actually trying to um, to help build the movement by we've um, have a project in partnership with another national um, women's organization called the Strong Hearts Native Helpline, and they're up underneath. We're the parent organization for them, and um, and and trying to work to create programs and projects that can eventually spin off and be their own organization and have their own seat at the table. Um, we also did that with another organization out of Alaska for Alaska Native women and helping to got a grant to help start a program and then eventually, you know, provide mentorship and and and, and advocacy for them to become their or, own organization. So now at the table, instead of it just being our organization, we have our organization and a separate Alaska Native women's organization who can really advocate for the needs in Alaska. And in Alaska, they have over 200 federally recognized tribes. So almost half the federally recognized tribes in the entire United States are in Alaska. So for them to have their own voice is really important. And so that's part of what we do also is, you know, we're at the table, but we're not the, 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 the only ones and we shouldn't be the only ones. So really trying to build the movement to bring more voices to the table, I think is really important as well. Great, fantastic. Um, two things that you said that I think are just fascinating and congratulations, one, that all of the women, uh, all the leaders of Cheyenne are now women, that's amazing. But just this idea that traditionally, hundreds of years ago, and I think that's probably true in West Africa as well, women did have a place at the table, women were the leaders, and, and it's how do we get back to that place where we were um, so long ago. Dr. Taki, can you talk a little bit about um, what your organization has done to elevate the voices of traditional and, and religious women leaders? And in the meantime, can I encourage um, all the people listening, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll have questions after this. So Dr. Taki, uh, could you talk a little bit about what you all have done uh, to elevate these voices? So one of the, the key uh, things. I think um, you may be a mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So one of the two um, is training. 
and uh, like I said before, it's um, to be able to give people the skills, women especially, um, the skills to be able to function well in well in the changing world. So uh, um, talked about um, have a group, and some of these groups me because a lot of these women cannot type. So once they're shown how to use the audio and record hold the meetings um, using audio. So people will send me in that voices, you know, uh, and we've we've had what um what they have to see. Um the trainings most times are are targeted. So because we believe that um that, you know the things that we do is advocacy and training. So and we, you, when you're training, you do with mental health in maternal care, how to look after you, what to do, um, you know, to to get the children to get vaccines. All these things put together is then we have trainings within the communities. Get the leaders um, to go, go and decision. But what we also do, and we found out that this is paying some dividend now. I, I mentioned the male champions that we have. So we're having a lot of male engagements, and we're having a lot of uh, intergenerational. So we're mixing um, in terms of older well, women, young women and adolescents. We're mixing them so that they understand each other. So in the, in the quest, um, for empowerment, in the quest for peace, in the quest um, for you know, the things that happen within our communities, for, um, in the communion, because sometimes, a lot of times, religion is used um, as a way of um, quietening or, 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 or making um, women's voices. So using all of these, we have the intergenerational gaps, we have the male engagement, and we have um, sometimes can be heated um, conversations within these uh, in these workshops that we hold. But towards the end, at the at the end, we gain that each other's role and what they need to do to develop the and um, develop individuals and develop the nation in 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 what we're doing. So these are some of the the examples I want to give, and and it's it's key. That um, I would say, um, I think it was said women are are, are secret. We we all times with the power that we have. Well, how much changes? How much um, in within our homes and how they can change dynamics? We on them or we don't so acknowledge that in us. So. Part of these in any of the trainings is bringing out confidence, it is bringing out, it is bringing out. So these are the things that put you when you put um, making into a whole social link because, like I said, the realms. And so now we're challenging what those 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 realms Monks are the norms. These were the religious leaders, with the traditional leaders. In laws now, two two days ago, the give equality and women from the policies go to into so that again it will guide whether the affirmative action or inclusivity and diversity and vulnerability voices are also part of um you know part of the discourse that we have all of these are the trainings that most times 50 50 does and the vessel is a coalition um 30 women and therefore, so when we do, do 
in a particular region, we make sure we make it so that it's, it's become so inclusive so that we have people from, from this, so that they take the message back, follow whatever has been learned, it is. So that as girls understand what to do and make this decision, that it has to be elements of, of regard and respect of what and so having the resilient emergencies as we're doing now um is really in patriarchy and um nowadays it doesn't work and that we need to the 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 elements um, within this um also is the support that um to each other when we collaborate but also when you identify ish i think we just lost dr taki um while we're waiting for her to come back uh, there was a question that i think is really interesting perhaps lucy you could take it first um the question is, and hopefully y'all can hear me because I seem to be a little bit frozen also, but Lucy, the question um, is, what would be your key message for more effective international support? Um, and then I'll turn to you, Ambassador, but you said you work at an international level. What can what can the international community do, especially when you talk about that 90% of the women who are violated are from outside the tribe? So what would you like from the international community? Well, I think that, you know, there's, Tribes have a particular status here in the United States that is fairly complex. Um, we're, we're sovereign nations. We existed prior to colonization. We were here. We had um, effective systems and governments. We um, had land bases prior to um, any uh, colonizing country arriving on North America. Um, but when those government, when those countries did come here, it it changed um, a lot. And so now, you know, we're considered uh, domestic dependent nations. Uh, we're we're recognized as by the federal government as having um, a, a limited amount of sovereignty. Um, you know, I think that we would advocate for ourselves in terms of the inherent sovereignty that we have as. Um, pre-existing nations, but we're um, within the um, the confines of the the federal government to some extent, um, illegally, um, according to you know um, federal law anyway. So a lot of the advocacy that we do is on a government to government basis as tribal governments to the United States federal government. We are not recognized as our own sovereign nation by other countries internationally. We're considered a part of the United States. So a lot of the advocacy that we do at the international level is not um, direct, um, but it's really, you know, the, the power for Indian nations within the United States of international advocacy is really uh, um, uh, more of a pressure kind of shaming type of advocacy. You know, the United States is considered one of the most um, developed countries in the world, and we still have Indian nations uh, within the United States where half of the fam um, half of the households don't have running water, um, where they don't have electricity. There's no broadband internet. You know, we're, we're um, in, in these situations that uh, largely because of colonization that we have these high levels of poverty where our land is considered to be legally, you know, um, it's owned by the tribe, but held in trust by the federal government to this point where this sort of idea that we um, don't have the ability to make our own decisions about our own land, which is um, ludicrous. Um, but that's the kind of legal system that we're dealing with um, in, in, in how it impacts 
the work that we do is it creates this very confusing jurisdictional scheme about if a crime against uh, a Native woman occurs, um, you have to go through this process of trying to figure out who actually has um, jurisdiction to, to prosecute the crime. And you have to go through these questions. Was the victim Native? Was the perpetrator Native? Did the crime occur on tribal land? Was it trust land, allotted land? Is it non-Indian land? Um, and it can become really complex. Um, and often, you know, it's almost like you need a law degree just to be able to figure that process out. And so it, it's just this, such a confusing issue that it creates this um, maze and creates all these gaps and holes in the system where our Native women and our Native children are the ones that fall through and end up not getting the justice they deserve. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do internationally is trying to raise these issues of where the federal government is failing our native communities. The federal government by federal law has a trust responsibility. Um, a lot of our tribes have direct treaties with the federal government and many of those treaty provisions are probably, you know, would I would say are not being met adequately. And you know, part of that is resources and funding. Um, and so, a lot of what we do is, you know, trying to advocate um, that these issues are still happening, and you know, getting decisions from some of these different international bodies that recognize that the United States has failed, um, and you know, different administrations deal with that um, differently. And then to some extent, you know, we can see improvements here and there when our federal government is sort of shamed at the international level for not. Um, abiding by agreements that they've made with Native people. So that's a lot of the kind of international work that, that, that we do and the advocacy that we do. Great. Thank you. I know we have just a few minutes left and there have been some great questions. Um, one of the questions that came in a, a couple different ways is thinking about um, young women and youth. And so maybe in the last four minutes, if each of you could say what you're doing or what you think should be done uh, to make sure that young women's voices are a part of this this discussion and and how to empower uh, these young traditional women um, in your communities. So again, we only have just a few minutes left, but why don't we start with you, Ambassador? Um, if you can talk just very briefly and any last things you might want to say, but maybe focus a little bit on the young women of our communities. Well, I think we we need the engagement with the international community is good, but it's good to engage our own national government in terms of. Uh, alleviating poverty with the traditional women because the, the, the traditional women once uh, they are empowered in terms of uh, eco they are empowered economically they can make a big difference and then so we need to engage our national government they, they travel uh, the traditional people have land and then they, they just need tools to be able to invest into agriculture mm -hmm. and then of course all of the the concessions are in the traditional areas, but the benefit is not to the traditional people. So it's good to empower the traditional women by giving them a platform so their voices can be heard. Another one is to have network of other international partners to support, to take the traditional women from a land of poverty to a more sustainable part of them. How do we engage the younger, younger girls in traditional women? We are engaging them. We're engaging the adolescent girls in their communities, in the villages. Right now, we have a project with them in few counties. We hope we can extend it to other counties. We are asking them to speak out, to say what they would like to be. What can they do if they're going to take in micro loans? Where do we do business and travel back and forth, trade with other countries? and like Guinea, Sierra Leone, back and forth into the market. We are giving them their own market tables so that they can learn from the, the, the older women on how they were able to manage to get over. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Taki, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but if you, uh, we just have about a minute or two left. If you have any last words, um, we were focusing a little bit on the international community and also young women in your community, but um, maybe in the last minute, if you have anything you wanted to add, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. 
goodness. Dr. Taki, are you able to hear us? Um, okay. Yes, just a very much for um on the we will continue doing what we do. We engage as well as other we're getting because we're getting because we're we, we fully that uh, yeah. um you know so there is there is there's some There's positive Unfortunately, I think Dr. Taki is coming in and out. So um, I think, Lucy, unless you wanted to add one last thing, I think we probably need to close the session, unfortunately. Um, we've been perceived young to making the changes that we need to do. In terms of internal uh, just award, um, that it's good we're having a conversation like this. And um, and and it's key that where support needs to come in, um, we work a lot because I've seen it's some of the issues that generate. You know, Lucy is saying the same things that we experience. Um, Madam Ambassador is saying the same thing that we experience. So some of these things are, you know, it, it becomes a generic thing for women. So when we collaborate across borders um, to see how we can make things better for ourselves and to even stretch our hands to give ourselves support. I think they the, would, would, would go a long way in terms of success. Thank you very much. For thank the you. All right. Well, I think I'd like to um, thank our three panelists. This has been fascinating learning about both your um, the situation in all three of your countries and the role that traditional women have played. I think it's, again, critical that when their voices um, have been put in the forefront during crises that we retain that, not just during crises, but, but throughout. I did uh, also want to thank the organizers of this and my colleague, um, my colleagues Kim Brown and Tana Krusen for all of their help with this panel. Um, I also to remind all of you who are uh, who have participated that um, there is uh, booths that you can go visit. Uh, please visit the exhibition page and you can uh, link into different organizations booths to learn more about what other organizations are doing. Uh, so with this, Lucy, Ambassador, um, Dr. Taki, thank you, all three of you. This has been amazing. I hope, I know there's been a lot of technical difficulties, but thank you all for bearing with us. And thank you to everyone for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to everything, but really very inspiring what you all are doing. So thank you, and thank you to all of you. Everyone have a good yeah. afternoon, and good luck to Liberia on your election. May it be peaceful and full of women's representation. Thank you. Thank you.